I want to thank the No-Till Association and the organizing committee for inviting me a year ago to talk about nutrient cycling. And then about a month ago, I got another request to add on a, another project. And I, I hope I can get to that this afternoon with the time that we have. But first of all, I'd like to recognize the people uh, that are part of the uh, Cover Crop Nutrient Cycling Project. Um, quite a list, and I'm not going to read them all off, but uh, lots of expertise there, um, lots of knowledge, and uh, really rely on them for, for a lot of good sound advice. And then our staff, uh, Dr. Debunker Samuel um, is a project coordinator for the, for the Cover Crop Nutrient Cycling Project, Justin Brown, a master's student, John Wolt, who's an extension associate, and then uh, Chris Morris works in the lab, and we're doing a lot of our analysis right, right in-house in our lab. Um, and of course, uh, USDA is funding this, this project, this on-farm project. Uh, we have two more graduate students coming, and we're excited about that, so it's, uh, it's, it's cranking along. But anyway, why are we concerned about uh, cover crop nutrient cycling? You know, cover crops sequester inorganic nutrients, and, um, you know, what's the availability to our cash crops? Is it uh, taking it away from those crops, or are, are we getting some release for those crops? I guess those are all questions that you have. Um, we're potentially converting mineral forms of nutrients into organic forms, and those become available as well. Um, one of those uh, examples would be non-labile phosphorus to labile forms of phosphorus, plant available forms of phosphorus. So we could be increasing those plant availabilities of that. Um, we're preventing nitrate nitrogen from getting in into our water supplies. And that, that's big with our stakeholders. Uh, the state of Iowa is, is working on that as well. And of course, we're increasing the need to build our total soil nitrogen as well. And we're building carbon. Uh, we need to build that, build that nitrogen component in the soil as well. And so, um, you might have all those or one of those on your mind, but you've probably been all reading these books too. And uh, these are good books. And, and um, Dr. Nichols mentioned Gabe Brown quite a bit, and, and you want to be like Gabe, right? And, and so uh, that's why we're having this, this conversation. But, <clears throat> but really what we're after is something like this, I think. And uh, this is a nitrogen rate study. Uh, in 2017, uh, where we had established rates of nitrogen put out in, a, in, in plots, 60-pound uh, increments, and we measured the yield response across those nitrogen rates. And, and we try to extrapolate what the ideal nitrogen rate was at this site, and I've done that, and it looks like 95 units at N. It took to raise the at, uh, optimal yield. But look at what the check plot produced. 187 bushels of corn. No, no nitrogen at all, okay? I think that's what we're after, right? We, we don't want to write the check for fertilizer. And uh, so if we do, by the way, that was a 25 years of no-till, 5.1% uh, organic matter, okay? And uh, if you do the math, though, uh, that 95 units of N, roughly 36 bucks, 35 bushels gain here, is worth $113. That's the inorganic agronomist's approach, right? That's, that's the economics. So I think at some point there needs to be a marriage of inorganic agronomy, what we're really, really good at, and organic agronomy, what Dr. Nichols is talking about. And that's got to happen at some point in the future for sustainability and so forth. Now we did the same, same exact study in, but in 2018, in the adjacent field, because of a rotation, uh, of course, uh, and this, this is not a corn and soybean rotation by any means, okay? But uh, again, high organic matter, now 26 years of no-till. But look at our, our yield there is barely at 180, okay? And our check plot is at about 140. So different year, different environment. Same hybrid, okay? So can you bank on these things happening year after year after year? Well, we're not in control of the climate, and the climate's really driving, driving a lot of this. But if you do the math, you know, again, about 35 bushels again. How, how ironic. 
you know, what, what's going on with that? But only uh, $20 of, for about 55 pounds of N. We don't know this number going into this, this event, do we? That, that's, that's the holy grail of inorganic agronomy. And I'm not ramming that down your throat this morning, but that's, that's where we've come from. And, and then and that's where we're at, right? That's, that's where we're really at. We know that, that developing no-till might have a higher need for nitrogen. Uh, a couple studies there done way back, uh, way back in the olden days. We do know that if you convert, you stop tillage, and, and you, have, you increase carbon, you gotta, you gotta do, get it, give it some extra nitrogen. And, and Dr. Nichols clearly pointed out that, that we can do that with diversity and microorganisms and so forth. But, but then Sarah Bowder came along and did some research on some very long-term no-till, and, and that need, this need for extra nitrogen has gone away, okay? So that's that, that's that microbiology that, that I don't know a lot about, because I was trained as an inorganic agronomist, and, and, and so that's that microbiology, okay? So at some point, it, it goes away. So the Cover Crop Nutrient Cycling Project has three objectives. We want to determine the influence of cover crops and their composition, compositions on nutrient cycling. We want to look at that also in uh, producers' fields, um, looking at the, the effect on the cash crop. And we also want to hone in on the effect of the carbon-nitrogen ratio, uh, i.e. different blends of cover crops, and how that affects the nitrogen uptake of corn and use, of corn, uh, use for corn. Okay, so three big objectives, and we're gonna try to hone in on those a little bit, but a quick observation on one of the plots that I had, we have our no cover crop control, and a plot with the cover crop, and this is a March picture, and you know, I looked down, and the day I was there, it was very prominent that, that the uh, cover crop plot had less wheat straw. And you may or may not see that, uh, in the light of this room, and so I've kind of focused in a little bit. Uh, that's what the straw looks like, like with the no cover crop, and here's the cover crop. And I, I think you can see that there's, it looks more open, and, and uh, we've, we've accelerated the breakdown of those residues, if you will. And so an effect of the cover crop. So what we're doing uh, with those three objectives is we're identifying cover crop compositions in the field. We're measuring the biomass. Uh, we're looking at the ADF and NDF content. Um, we're measuring the decay and the nutrient loss out of those residues. And we're looking at how those fields were managed. Now these are on-farm on examples. And we're really looking for a lot of cover crop fields. So if you're growing a cover crop and you can remember to call me, please do that. I'd like to come out and sample it. So, so objective one, this is what we do. We just go out in your field and we uh, uh, randomly choose a spot. We cut the biomass and take soil samples, okay? Uh, this is a very broad look of the nutrient results from objective one. And uh, there's a lot of details going on here. But we measure things like organic matter, nitrate, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and zinc. Um, and in particular, just to kind of get this going along, I, I noticed that uh, from the fall sampling to the spring sampling, we, we had an increase in nitrate nitrogen, okay, in those cover crop fields. Now that's an average of all of them. And at the end of the day, we hope to characterize these in a little bit different way, maybe by, by, by the carbon content of the cover crop and other things like that. So this is just a broad look. And, and the, uh, the summary of these results change monthly, okay? <laughs> so this is a snapshot just right now, right today, on a very young emerging, emerging project. Uh, another thing to notice is the fall uh, potassium soil test versus the spring. It went down. Now potassium is, is very problematic. It's affected by clay and clay structures in the soil and how dry or how wet the soil is. But I, I just wanted to point that out. That's, that's a pretty, pretty big drop, okay, for not doing anything uh, to the soil. 
So moving on to objective two, it, it expands on objective one. And what we do is we, again, seek uh, areas in uh, producer fields. And we try to get there just as the cover crop's emerging and we, we spray it out. Uh, we try to keep it from establishing. Because then we've got uh, plots with and without cover crops. Again, we're looking at the blends and the biomass and the nutrient composition and, and all those things. And here's kind of a picture of what we're doing. Um, this one looks like it's a heavy brassica blend, but we've established our plots. Okay, you can see that uh, around the state. So again, constantly looking for places to do this work. Um, now this gets a little bit more expanded because now we have no cover and cover in a producer field and we have our fall and our spring sampling and it gets a lot of data heavy right but we have some of those similar soil test values that are our parameters that we had in objective one but again the nitrogen comes out again and is this a surprise i i don't think it is i don't think it's a surprise but our fall samples had uh, had these amounts and then we came back in the spring uh, they went down and that was with the cover crop. So this nitrate nitrogen we measured in the soil is what? It's, it's vulnerable to the environment, right? It's, it's just there, okay? In a form we don't want it to be. But if you look at the cover crop sampled in the fall, these, these levels here, six and a half and roughly 22, are much lower than in the no cover crop plots, correctly? So that cover crop's doing what we want it to do. It's taking up inorganic nitrogen, okay, and storing it. And then when we came back in the spring, look, look at the levels in the cover crop versus where we didn't have the cover crop. They're quite higher, aren't they? And so there is some, something going on there, whether it's a release or not, I don't know, but, but something, something is happening after that cover crop. Other things, again, is that potassium, taking a dive from the fall to the spring sampling, although with the cover crop in objective two, we're kind of holding our own, if you will. Okay, we're kind of holding our own. Anthony, yes? Are there cover, none of them cover crops overwinter then? In a few cases, we had some cereal rye. Yep, in a few cases. All of that data is put together in one picture, and that's what I did. Um, I, yeah, I, I have to get this out in 40 minutes, <laughs> and, and so that's my attempt. Russ? The question of potassium is that you, when you were building the recommendations for the state, were they spring samples or fall samples? That's a really good question. Um, that's really, really old data. Um, probably mostly spring samples. Because we would have went out, found a location to do our work in the spring and took the samples then. Yep. Anybody else? I really, I welcome questions. So anyway, okay, so um, I advanced there. So then we measured the yields, the no cover and the cover yields at each one of our sites. So we had uh, five sites, Southeast Farm, Salem, Gerritsen, Madison, and Clark, three corn and two soybean. Just uh, no cover and cover, and you can see the uh, yield differences. Is there enough to talk about? We're not. But you gotta pay your bank, don't you? <laughs> right? At some point, you wanna get away from that. I get that. You wanna get to, to Gabe Brown's point, right? I, I do too. I farm, I want, I'm, I'm looking at that. That's my target. But you still got to get you got to get there at some point. So, are those yields worth talking about? No, I don't think so. We didn't do the stats, but you can just look too. Okay. We do not, not yet. What's that? No, <laughs> it's not. That that's a fallacy of our objectives. But that's another, that's another objective. Dr. Senyal wants to do that. And I think we're going to attempt to do a couple sites. I got 
Yeah. Sure. Thank you, Ruth. The question was, are we looking at the effect of the no cover cover at the subsequent year or a couple years later? And my answer was no. Uh, that was not one of the objectives of the study, but uh, Dr. Samuel has pushed me, and we're going to try to monitor a couple sites as best we can. Yep, your name is on my list. Believe it. it was. <laughs> Wayne and I know each other, so I can say that. Anyway, but okay, there it is. So now going on to objective three, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, we're looking for some type of small grain field where we can go in and establish cover crops. Um, we want to min minimize volunteer volunteerism as much as possible. Um, in my experience with cover crops, that's been, been an issue, okay, uh, especially with oats. Um, so we want to try to minimize that. Um, we, of course, can control the volunteers on our, on our check plots, but we can't in our mixes. We just can't, so it is what it is. Um, we're going to establish uh, these plots according to the producer's equipment, of course. Um, and we had three mixes. We have a, 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 of course, we have a check, but we have a broadleaf um, grass mix, a 50-50, and I'll show you what I got in them. Uh, a predominantly, predominantly grass mix, predominantly broadleaf mix, and um, we're going to look at the biomass. We're going to impose some nitrogen rates there across these blends. Um, the producer plants their crop. They just can't apply any fertilizer to the plot area. Um, we'll take a look at that crop and we'll, we'll measure some yields. So um, this is the blends, uh, the grass blend, uh, heavy on the grasses of course, 22.5% of these, 25 on the broad leaves there. The blend, the 50-50 blend, 12.5 straight across and then flip-flop for the broad leaf blend of what the grass is. See 2.5% of the uh, grasses and 22.5% of each of the Broadleaf. So just keeping it simple, uh, eight species, um, it is what it is. We just want to keep that. But really what we're looking at is we want to, we really want to compare the data to the carbon nitrogen ratio of the cover crop. And so one place we may get our, our you know, we might get a lot of grasses that do well, of course, and we we get a, get a lot of grasses in our broadleaf too, but we've really got enough measurements that, that we think we can uh, take a look at the data and compare it across sites. So here's a plot plan. Um, of course, four replications. Here are those cover crop blends, the check, the grass, the blend, 50-50 blend, and then the broadleaf, and that repeats itself randomly in four replications. And then we impose our nitrogen rates across each one of those those cover crop treatments. So 96 plots at a site, 96 plots. Here's just a picture of the, uh, the blend versus the control. And you can see we have uh, dead plants out there that we've sprayed out, trying to keep that under control because they're continuously coming, okay? So that, that poses a problem, but, but we're measuring the residues there as well. So, so we're good. Okay, here's uh, some of the nutrient results, okay. Um, gets a little bit more confusing, but here's 2017 fall sampling, spring sampling, check, grass, broadleaf blend, and then it repeats itself, okay. There's those same parameters. And we've started looking at uh, potentially mineralizable nitrogen, active carbon, it's a uh, pox carbon, and then solvita, this is uh, respiration, CO2, to see if there's any relationship there as well. Uh, just some things to highlight is the nitrogen again. So I've highlighted that in objective one, objective two, and now I've pointed it out in objective three. And uh, we see some really interesting, interesting things, uh, maybe a little bit different than than, uh, than objective one and objective two, but, but um, um, somewhat um, higher in the spring than in the fall. And uh, we really, but that check plot uh, remained high from, from the fall to the spring. So 
Uh, again, this is emerging, emerging data that we got to look at. Potentially mineralizable nitrogen, I'm going to point that out as well. Um, we have a higher, higher number in the fall versus the, the spring. And, um, you know, that's your microbiology. That's the timing of those samples. And this is an average of all of our sites. I, I, I didn't know any other way to do it other than just bring, it, bring that forth that way and, and go with it. Okay, here's a yield. Um, the effect of the cover crop on the yield. So looking at the average across all of the nitrogen rates at each site, but looking at the effect of the cover crop. Okay, so we got our control, no cover crop, about 80 bushels at Surf, 172 at Gerritsen, 215 at Salem, and 132 at Gettysburg. With the cover crops at, at Beersford, the yields tended to go up, okay, slightly. With the cover crops at Gerritsen, kind of a mixed bag. Corn following grass, similar yield. Corn following the broadleaf or the blend, looks like those yields are reduced a little bit. That may be something to talk about. But as we keep going here, Salem, hardly any effect at all. You can take a look at those yields. But at Gettysburg, kind of a different story than Gerritsen. Uh, there's your control, the grass, a lower yield, the broadleaf, a lower yield, but the blend, a similar yield. Could this be random? Certainly, it could be random. Russ, you're, whole, you're going like that. <laughs> Pointing at the numbers, right? So, very wet, surf. I mean, record, historic water, right? Gerritsen, uh, very above normal. Not as much as surf, I don't think. Salem, I think, totally optimum. Probably some high amounts of precipitation in there, but I think just a garden, okay? Just, just, just great. Gettysburg, water limited. So four different environments, maybe somewhat different, different effect. So now I'm gonna go on, I'm gonna look at individual sites as far as the nitrogen effect. Of course at the surf, no difference in, in, um, in the cover crop effect or the nitrogen effect. Just too much water, okay? At Gerritsen, a very nice nitrogen response. Um, just really, really good. Uh, we see the broadleaf and the blend here starting out lower um, at, compared to the, the grass and the check. But as we increase nitrogen rate, they, they kind of come together, if you will. But a nice, nice nitrogen spot. Now what I'm looking for is I'm looking that if, if um, does one of the cover crop blends cause the optimum nitrogen rate to be lower? And I would say no with this site right here, okay? We need more and more and more of these sites. That's, that's the key to inorganic agronomy, okay? That's, that's the key. And we go to Salem. Look at that. We might argue a little bit that it took about 40 pounds, but look at the check plot. There, there's, there's not hardly any relationship to nitrogen rate and corn yield response. Now these are all really well-managed no-till sites, okay? So I would assume the soil health would be as optimum as we could get in the region. That was kind of the goal or the objective is to, to go look at that. And I kind of think I'm looking at it wrong. I think I should be going to producers' fields that are just getting into soil health, and we see the effect of the cover crop. Okay? But I got all those smart people in the room when we started this thing, and that's what we decided. And, you know, I'm not laying blame, because I'm, I'm the project leader, but I'm kind of thinking I should refocus just a little bit. But, but anyway... Uh, precipitation just right here at that site. Then we go to Gettysburg, 
and uh, we get some mixed results there. Uh, the grass and the check um, starting out lower than the broadleaf and the blend, but then as we increase nitrogen rate, they're coming together at some point. But look at no response where we had the check in the in the in the blend, but we got our somewhat of a response where we had the check. Or excuse me, the um, yeah the check in the blend, no response. But the broadleaf and the grass were getting a little bit of a nitrogen response at Gettysburg. No livestock involved. No livestock. We, we had to get that out of our objective. And, and, and hey, that's a, whole nother, that's a whole nother thing that's got to be looked at. Obviously, it's got to be looked at. Okay, so I'm going to go away from the, the nutrient part and hope you've picked up something there. Uh, uh, I think it's, you know, obviously we're going to be seeing an effect on our nitrogen in the soil. And um, I, I think the results are kind of showing that. So we got a request to look at soil moisture. That's always coming up. Um, it was only initially supposed to be looked at in the western part of the state, but, but some things happened and we expanded it. And uh, so we've outfitted uh, several of our objective three sites. Uh, with nitrogen probes, and you can see them laying here. Uh, these probes measure uh, water content at 5, 10, um, 15, 25, 35 centimeters down the length of that probe, okay? We stick them in and they take a measurement every hour. So we have a lot of data, and uh, we're looking at, we can only afford it as many to put in the control and the grass treatments. Um, those little sticks are $1,800 a piece, okay? So to outfit three sites, we spent about $45,000. So, so anyway, um, here's what it looks like when it's installed. Uh, has a has a data port here, and actually the data is stored down here, and then the probe is over here in the ground. And so we've chose to put them in the control in the grass. So just some preliminary data from Mitchell. Um, we put them out uh, northwest of Mitchell. That's a lot of data uh, from September 27th to November 28th there. Uh, you can see that the control had uh, lower soil moisture up to the point it rained. Okay, this is a significant rain event. And then after that it flip-flopped. The, uh, the grass plot has slightly higher moisture than the control. Well, why would that be? Well, I think the grass was kind of taking some water out here and it, it was somewhat dry. There was a lot of moisture deeper in the profile. I mean, a lot. I mean, it was sopping wet when we put those probes in. And I think what, what we're gonna, I'm trying to try to establish here is the grass was extracting water from down below, okay? Pulling it up. So you can see here at six inches, not as much difference, but again, the effect of the rain got, got in, got, got down there, but, but a little bit lower probably. And then at 10 inches, um, again, the grass is higher as we go deeper in the profile now, even before the rain, okay? There's 18 inches, it's higher. I think it's pulling it up, okay? Water's going towards the roots, okay? So I, I only went down to 18, but we've got data further down. So um, next I'm gonna show you some, um, some soil biology work that uh, Justin Brown did at his site in Sturgis. And uh, uh, first the biomass, um, the, uh, the mix had slightly higher biomass than the grass and the broadleaf at his project. The PFLA total microbiomass, um, highest in the, the broadleaf in the mix and the control in grass, similar. Okay, go on to the bacteria, control lowest, the broadleaf in the blend, uh, the highest with grass somewhere in between, and the fungi, control lowest. With, with the cover crops all pretty similar. So we're seeing the benefits of the cover crops with the uh, microbiology. Okay, so in summary, 
Uh, we're just beginning. We need a lot more data and a lot more sites, and, and I'd appreciate your help with that. Um, nitrate in was higher in the spring samples um, in the producer fields. Initial results from objective two show that the cover crops did not significantly reduce yield of the cash crops. I think that's, that's big. Albeit, all of those sites were east of, um, I can't say, Highway uh, 37, 25, east of Highway 25. Let's go with that one. So we need to get a few more sites out west. Uh, nitrate in was lower in the fall and higher in the spring with the cover crops. So the cover crops were doing, doing their job. And uh, boy, with those four sites that I showed you the data, it's really inconclusive where the cover crop affected the nitrogen requirements of corn. Uh, we just need more sites. And the microbial biomass was higher after the cover crops compared to the control. So, so all good things happening there. Okay, that covers the cover crop nutrient cycling stuff. I made it, but I don't have much time left. Any questions about that? Okay, let's keep going. So I had a little project this summer uh, with an intern, Chase Daly. Um, he goes to USD. <laughs> anyway, so it's a, kind of a combination of SDSU and USD folks. They have a sustainability program, okay? And Chase is from a farm and he's interested in an agricultural sustainability project. So what we did is we wanted to compare the carbon and total, total nutrient status of native grass versus to cropland right next door. And we wanted to calculate the nutrient decline rate of the cropland and estimate long-term nutrient sustainability. Okay? That's a mouthful. You don't think about this every day. Dwayne talks about a 200-year plan and a 600-year plan the Native Americans have. Right, Dwayne? Native Americans are 480. Okay, 480. <laughs> big, big years. We're worried about next tomorrow and the next year, right? Anyway, so we're going to look at that. Northwest of Mitchell, two fields, native grass, um, and uh, about 100 years of cropland, 70 years tilled, 30 years no-till. Uh, we sampled three different sites on each side of that fence, five different cores at each one of those sites. Those are our depths. We did bulk density, and we analyzed organic carbon, total nitrogen, um, uh, total phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur. Total, not plant available. So what happens is they use some wicked acids and they dissolve the soil. And then they measure the nutrients. So we're looking at total nutrients. Okay, Dr. Ward did this down in his lab. It's a nitric plechoic acid approach. And I will tell you that there's one more acid that should have been added, but Nobody on the planet wants to work with hydrofluoric acid, so I couldn't find a lab to do that. So this is the best I can get, and that's what we did. And then we measured pH 2. But I want to first discuss why do we want to, what's our interest in total nutrients? Why does anybody care? And so I had a little project that I looked at. It's kind of a hobby of mine, but I took NAS data from 1981 to 2015, and I took the 12 major crops during that period, and I took their yields, and I took, took it, multiplied the yields times the estimated crop removal. Okay, the estimated crop removal. So how much phosphorus is being taken out of the soil by the crop? Well, you can see it's massive. Back in 1981, it was about 120,000 tons of P205 coming out of South Dakota soil into our 12 major crops. 120,000 tons. And it's done nothing but go up, right? Because yields have gone up, right? I did alfalfa. I, you know, I, I did them all. They also have records about how much phosphate has been applied in the state. That's the red line. So are we meeting crop removal? Absolutely not. 
Now, I'm not making a case for inorganic agronomy. I'm not. Okay? But here's, here's the deficit. So this is the balance determined between uh, fertilizer additions and crop removal. So this would be the removal. Okay? And, and some years we had less removal and then we had application. Drought years, whatever. Okay? Around the state. So, when Duane talks about shipping all that phosphorus to China, there's the data right there. What's that? They're getting a good deal because they're buying what? They're buying the oil and the protein, right? They're getting the phosphorus for free. They're getting it for free. Are we willing to give it up? This won't affect anybody in this room. <laughs> so that's why it's kind of like, why are you talking about this? Well, anyway, it's a project. We got to look, we got to compare native grass and cropland. So here's the phosphorus, total phosphorus by depth, blue line, cropland, yellow line, native grass. The only place that the nutrient level is higher in the cropland the only graph I'm going to show you, the only ones right here. Phosphorus is higher in the 0 to 3 of the cropland versus the native grass. Why is that? That's where all the fertilizer goes, right? That's where it all goes. We're seeing differences all the way down practically. The crop is moving, removing phosphorus from those depths, right? So this data confirms this data. Because that native grass has just cycled, right? Sure, a cow or a deer or a buffalo came along and took a little bit, just a little bit, because they crapped most of it back out, right? Okay, so here's where, here we go. Potassium, all depths lower. Sulfur, all depths lower. Organic matter, all depths lower. Less down below, of course, but look at, look at the surface. 4.3 versus 6.2. Now, this is organic matter. Okay? But we're extracting organic carbon way down. Way down. Okay? Organic carbon, really the, the important one. The, this organic matter is kind of a a well, quick way to measure it, but here's carbon, verifies it. Huge differences. Now, not as much down deeper, but, but it's happening. Okay? Total nitrogen, same story. Total nitrogen, same story. Okay? So, really interesting. Soil pH, Dwayne talks about this a lot. Look at the pH difference between the cropland and the native grass. Why do we need lime? Because <laughs> well, we're using a lot of nitrogen. Okay. Look at that native grass. Big difference. Now bulk density. What is bulk density? It's just weight per volume in the soil. Okay. Just weight per volume. Look how much higher in the cropland it is compared to the native grass. So, so this is what we've done, <laughs> trying to feed the world. We've done a really good job at it. You know, we've really come a long way. I'm not trying to scare anybody out of the room because I don't have any answers. <laughs> you know, really I don't, but we've got to have a plan. So when I tell folks we've got to build nitrogen as we build carbon, there's, there's the evidence. Five minutes, good, I'm going to make it. There's the evidence right there. That's about the best relationship of a soil test value I have ever seen in my, in my profession. It's almost one-to-one. -one. Almost. So it's real. What Dr. Nichols and Delane talk about and all the other soil health people talk about, this is a real deal, okay? So what we did is we looked at the, of uh, course, we measured elemental phosphorus. And, of course, the native grass is higher, has more throughout the profile, right? There's the numbers, okay? I converted that to...
to a fertilizer equivalent amount. Here they are. So the native grass has about 1,100 pounds of P205 more in that profile than the cropland. About 1,360 pounds more K2O and 2,200 pounds more sulfur, sulfate sulfur. So if I take that difference and I divide by that 100 years, 100 years of cropland, we have decreased the soil total nutrients by these amounts per year. About 11 pounds of P205, 14 of K2O, and 22 of sulfate sulfur. So we're really good miners. <laughs> okay. So how long can we do this at our current, current practices? Well, those numbers of years are huge, aren't they? But what did Dwayne say the Native Americans' plan was, 480 years? It's pretty darn close, isn't it? It's pretty close. So there is an end to all of this, someday. So, you know, sustainability is pretty important, and I, I applaud Chase for being interested, because private industry is sold out for sustainability, and it... It's not to sustain the current status quo, but what they're looking at is like companies like 3M, when they ship tape or whatever they make to wherever it goes, they know exactly how much water they're shipping to. So sustainability is a big thing, and, and I was asked to present this. I wasn't going to make a big deal out of it because there's, no, there's not a lot of answers. Okay? Building soil is the answer. I, if I had to give one. Building soil has is, is got to be the answer, but there's only so much there, and then we just, just got to keep after it. So, so in summary, um, all nutrient carbon and pH levels were higher in the native prairie, except phosphorus in the zero to three cropland, um, manipulated by our, our phosphorus applications. Soil bulk density was greater in the cropland soil, Carbon and nitrogen highly correlated, and uh, total nutrient supply has limits. I'll just say that. I don't know how else to say it. But uh, now I'm not advocating everybody run home and put on a bunch of fertilizer. Well, nope. Because <laughs> you could extrapolate that out of this, right? And, and you, you can't overcome it. You're not going to overcome it. So, so that's this combination of inorganic agronomy merging to organic agronomy. That's why you're here today. That's why you're learning like I'm learning. And, uh, and then that's what we have to do. So any questions about that? I think you're all in awe. I don't know. Or it's a waste of time. But thanks for your time today. <laughs>